and people, the public should be aware that um, um, we, they virtually have a monopoly. They, we, we, by our contract, basically have to buy from them. There is nobody that can compete with them. And so we can negotiate with them, but we don't have a lot of leverage. Okay. Um, I might be able to read about this, not in the budget meeting, and get the definition of this. But will you tell me about the tutors? How many tutors do we have? And do we plan out tutors throughout the year? And I wouldn't. I would have thought tutors were a contractor person, so they wouldn't have benefits attached. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the case here. Where is that? Um, there's a couple spots for tutors through salaries and benefits. One is um, 8800-1210 on page 3. Sorry, a couple places throughout. Well, this is salaries and benefits that didn't break out, did it? Did well, down below. Oh, down below. Okay, um, so that's a different number. Tutors and substitutes are 8800 And it's a small number. Um, I just didn't expect us to pay benefits for tutors. When we hire a tutor, it is an employee. That person is an employee, and we have to pay them through payroll. And when we do that, we have to cover them for unemployment, for workers' comp, uh, for those types of taxes that we have to um, pay for, for those employees. They don't receive any health benefits or any other um, teacher benefits, but they, we do have to pay for unemployment and workers' comp okay. and Medicare. Okay. Well, that's okay. um, And so how many tutors do we have throughout the... We don't have any that are on, um, that are hired on a regular basis, or we may have a few, very few that are hired on a regular basis, but uh, usually it's as needed. They're hired as needed. And that's... It's very short term, so it might be a student that for example, is expelled or suspended, or might have a mental health issue going on, and so we to bring them back in. We might slowly do that with a tutor, okay. but it's short-lived. Right now, I don't think we have. Pretty sure we don't have any tutors at this point. Don't don't we use tutors for kids with concussions and so forth? We sometimes have students out for an extended period of time we provide tutorial services right so they don't fall too far behind. And when that happens, they go through the IS department or 504? It, it, it really depends. Sometimes uh, the concussions, if they're under a 504 claim, yes. Um, and then we work through Pauline to figure out which line it comes out of. Jeff has a All the schools have a line. Okay. And then I have, a, I have a line as well. And most of the kids that go into like a Spring Harbor type of thing, um, we do because we want them to be educated. So we do pay for that. Right. So when they're in a residential placement for a little bit, we will pay for that. Mm -hmm. Then they come back and then they go right back into there. Thank you. I just had a question on benefits um, and on the structure. I know there's uh, legislation, I don't know if it's been proposed, but on changing um, state employee benefits. If you retire at a certain age, there's a different share. Would that impact our school district whatsoever? Is that a different pool of benefits or are all our staff covered just by the Cape Elizabeth benefit plan? With, with retirement, it's no cost at all. I mean, under the governor's proposal, what will happen is that anyone in that retirement system, which is most of the educators, would um, be paying 2% more, so they would see a 2% decrease. We don't, as a town, contribute, the state contributes the other portion, so it's all employee or state. So The governor's cut does not include health benefits, it's, it's retirement benefits. Is, is don't, don't, that, don't, we pay, don't we pay a portion of the retirement? Don't, isn't there a contribution made by the school district for, for retirement? Not for teachers' retirement. No. That's all state. The state pays like 45% of the cost of a retiree's health benefits. Okay. 
and the retiree pays the rest. Thank you. I guess I have one more question. Um, for the co-curricular activities as well as the stipend positions, are every six months or year a stipend position for a team leader um, gets chosen and therefore added to their salary? So that's when we switch up, um, add to the benefit line. So with the, is that how it works? With the, with the position, stipend position comes the benefits as well. Work. The benefit portion of it? Yes. Asking about the benefit portion of co curricular yes. stipend? I guess because I'm wondering if there's um, someone who's always a, a stipend for a department lead. Mm -hmm. um, most likely they're the same person each year for their, is it a contra under contract? And so why are we breaking it up separately? Than their average, than their salary, basic salary. Right. You see that. You see a lot of accounts, a lot yes. of separate accounts. That is because of state requirement. The state requires us to break out any co-curricular stipend uh, from the regular teacher stipend, and also the benefit for that, just for that stipend, the benefit has to be broken out. Thank you. But to follow up on that, it doesn't, if you get a stipend, it doesn't increase your health benefit. That still stays no. the same. And in terms of retirement, it's your last year's, I don't assume it would only, it has almost minuscule effect unless you're getting a stipend in your last year's, whether or not it's kind of sour or not. Is that correct? That's really, I guess, what I was doing. I did, I, yeah. but I didn't want to just jump in. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions about benefits? Okay, so let's move on then to instructional support. Questions about instructional support? I, I, this may go into revenues rather than instructional support, and I'd be glad to hold my questions today. I have a lot of questions about Medicaid reimbursement, and I don't have a lot of questions about the expenses. Um, and I, I said don't have a lot just in case I want to look through. I, I do have some. I don't get them. needled anymore. <laughs> yeah. um, but my question is more after with Medicaid and what we're doing with it and how we're going to get reversed in the future and the look back requirements. If that's for revenue, then I will, I'll be glad to wait and find us. It's listed under other revenue, but you know, uh, the IS department is one that earns us that, gets us that money. So do you want to leave it for revenues? I think it would be more yeah. appropriate there. Okay. Yeah. We'll okay. Other questions, expense side questions on instructional support. I guess the only one I have is um, why did we change it for, or well, why is it now contracted employees for OT and whatever? Why do we now use contracted employees rather than in house employees? We've always had contracts. Right. Um, and the contract, it, the, the, we have to. We've actually moved most of the contracts into employees. So our psychologists last year, the year before were actually contracts. So we've been, we put them as employees last year. Um, and we have OT contract, which is two days. Um, our PT is always contract, mostly the PTs around Cumberland County are, are contract. So those are pretty much contract in our ABA specialist um, who comes in four to five times a month is a contract as well. So it, it, it makes sense because everything, the IEP changes, so therefore we don't have consistent time with those. Um, no, it's just really based on all the IEPs. Take all the IEPs and you really look at um, the services for those related services, even the psych stuff, and that we really felt with a psychologist that we needed them as employees. They're already maxed out, as, as, as you know, as we talked about. And then the OT, I mean, we only need two days. So I don't want to make a position right now for that. We don't really need it. So. And so we look at these positions. We can, you can hire or um, like change the contract anytime during the year. No, I do the contracts. Um, I do them every once the um, our local entitlement fund comes out, which is the three hundred sixty-three thousand. 
about July, I start looking at contracts and, and pretty much the same year to year. I mean, I just go in, change the year, um, it's a standard contract, and then it goes out to the, to the contract. So. And that's standard operating procedure for all schools? I'm not doubting you, I just no, no, kind of understand. No, absolutely. I'd like to have more OTs around and PTs. Stop talking. You don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm always school, about but three. standard for Yarmouth and Kick. Oh, well then. <laughs> the two I know. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I know from other directors, they all do contracts too. Because mm -hmm. it makes more sense to do it this way. Yep. And, and it saves money this yeah. way. And for example, right now we're going to a plethora of referrals. So I'm, I'm, I have a, I need to contract with a, another psychologist to do some of those. So, and that goes through, I don't sign those contracts. The superintendent signs those. So there is a check and balance just to let you know. Um, Dom, uh, one of the things about IS is different than most of the others is your expenditures can fluctuate greatly in a year depending upon circumstances beyond your control. Yep. And I think the public are not, you don't have a separate re uh, contingency fund or reserve for that. So, is that correct? That's correct. So if we have, like you mentioned, we had a new, a little had a new referral, then we think it's going to cost us, four, uh, out of place, uh, excuse me, out of district placement, which will cost us about 47000 so, you know, one or two or three blips during the year could easily increase the cost, uh, you know, fifty to a hundred thousand dollars, you know, significant dollars, in other words, in the in the IS budget, through no fault of of IS. Yep, the, you're, you're correct. I think I think what we're seeing is the range of kids that we're getting now, and they they're, it's very difficult sometimes to program for them, and a couple of the kids that we even talk about these out-of-district placements, they're even having harder times than those out-of-district placements. So just to let you guys know, they might even come back. Who knows? So those are the things that are, are really hard to, to determine. So, but to answer your question, yes, sometimes it's very difficult. Now, taking the other side of the coin, if for some reason uh, a kid moves out of district that happened to be, let's say, a reasonably heavy user of IS services, that does that or does that not necessarily mean a decrease in cost? Because I assume, I guess I'm answer, I'll answer the question for it, but I assume most of your employees are salaried employees. Yes. So if there's a decrease, it just means there's more available to help other people. Correct. What, what, what happens is there's always a void, <laughs> and we have to rearrange the furniture. Kind there's of always a void? You mean not enough people? There's always, the, well, we, we have people and we try to really keep it um, working well. For example, we have, another, uh, we have a student moving in from up north. It has a one-on-one, -on -one, and we have to take that IEP as it comes in. So we're rearranging. It takes us a, we have a couple months to prepare for that student. So we're kind of rearranging the chairs to do that. So arranging staff. So the same thing. It could. So for example, uh, if you're thinking at the high school, and we and we have a student moving out, um, so we'll move people <coughs> up and down the scale to try to to cover that within a year. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. And I'm just trying to make a point for the public. You do the best you can to predict who's coming in or who might need. It's also possible, I assume, that certain students' need for IS services could, could fluctuate during the year. Yep, fluctuate. A lot more, a lot. Yep. <clears throat> so, it's, so I'm just, when we get to terms in terms of thinking about contingencies and reserves, one of the things we have to think about is the possible fluctuations within your department that you have no control over. Yep. Okay, thank you. Well, you raise a good point, David. I mean, when times get better, you might want to consider a special ed reserve account because one family moving into the district can blow a school budget right out of the water. Um, and if you have a reserve account for that, then you can be pretty skinny on your projections on expenditures, which Dom is right now. All we're doing is projecting what is needed. Bigger districts would carry three or four extra out of district uh, tuitions just to be safe. Well, that leads me to one more question. You probably shouldn't have told me that, but you're right. I, I, um, in the last couple of years, it seems to me, at least a couple of years I've been on, we've always had instances where one or two kids come in, and there's always, it's almost, it's a contingency, but it's not an unknown contingency. It almost always happens. We get maybe one out of district placement, one new kid comes in, so to a certain extent, maybe we've got to think stronger about putting some money aside for that, because it's not that uncommon circumstance, am I right? You're, you're right. I think our numbers, I mean, the data shows it. I mean, we're, as the population goes down, again, I keep saying this, our number keeps staying the same. 
I even think it's going to jump up a little bit higher. And it's not because of over-identification. It's